I'm gonna make a kimono. I bought this fabric. I found it on a place called Merchant and Mills. This is their great packaging they use. It's all as minimal as possible. So you're not getting loads of plastic coming through your door. But this is it, it's Merchant and Mills. It's in the UK, obviously. I found this on their website and it reminded me of a scene out of a documentary I was watching called The Story of China by Michael Wood. They had these enormous chests found in a cave from the Qing dynasty, so from the sort of 1600s to the 1900s, that's when they were around. And they had these big chests carved out of wood with these beautiful elaborate patterns, a bit like, say, a, if you think of a cinnabar or something like that, these kind of patterns, but it was navy blue. And I, oh, that bang needs that. I've been obsessed with it everything, ever since. I always saw it as an outfit when I saw these boxes on the, on the documentary. And lo and behold, I was on the site just scrolling through, seeing what was new, and they had this beautiful linen. So it's 100% linen. It's, it's very heavy. This is gonna be one big kimono, and you'll see when I get the lining as well, it will be. But it's exquisite. It's got this lovely border here as well, 10 centimeters from the selvage, which I think I'll use for the sleeve, so it's over the wrist like that. And it winds its way across the whole piece. So I bought three meters, three yards or so of that. And then this is the lining. So these boxes had a lining in them themselves. And it was a, um, it was an insect repellent paper. I think they used camphor or something. I don't know what it was, but anyway, it was lime. And imagine that, that this is what set it off, is that having that lime against the navy, one of the best color combinations out there. And so I bought this, this is the, from Merchant and Mills as well. Um, this is not paid or anything, they're just great. They do great linen. And I had their swatch card. I didn't have this one in it, but I could tell from the website how the colors turned out on the swatch and then if this was gonna be the right brightness. Uh, because it's a bit hard over the internet to see because colors do change. So anyway, this is their swatch card of all their linens. They have amazing colors. Look at that, I'll put it into the, the light. The whites, you've got this beautiful pine, ginger, all the way through there's, you know, navies and browns. And this one I quite like a lot is Boston Fall. It's sort of a, a russet brown. Those two, I'm definitely gonna get them and do something with them. It's beside the point. This is the, it's 143 centimeters wide. So I think that, I think that's, I'll put it in here, but I think that's a 65 inch or, a, or 60 inch and so's the navy. Navy, the navy is slightly larger, just ever so slightly wider, and that's gonna work out really well. I'll show you why in a minute. But these are the two, so here we go. So it's linen and linen, and if I hold it up, this is about the the whole garment. There's, there's barely any wastage when you make a kimono. This is heavy, so it's, even though it's linen, it's more of a winter outfit, and I've been wearing linen kimono at, as a sort of surcoat just around the house during the winter with the heating on it's great because it's got it breathes and it absorbs sort of moisture so if you do start to sweat it's there but but it with a heavy linen it's it's still hot <laughs> um so so it's it's a good little combination i think and i'll show you how they're going to go together so instead of a lining instead of lining this I'm going to back it. Um, backing instead of lining, if you don't know, is a lining is is the sort of a mirror of the garment sewn in, and it's loose from the garment, so it would it sits sits apart and it has its own seams. If you back it, you sew the you sew this fabric onto the back of this fabric, and then you put the seams together, um, and so you can see the seams. So it will be. It will be, when you look inside it, there'll be panels of this lime green, but then there'll be seams about that wide or so. Can you see that? Of the navy coming through, and some of these little bits will come through as well. So I think it will look really good. Um, it strengthens the garment, so this this doesn't need it. It's, it's all very hardy stuff, but it's more for the aesthetic. Um, 
and I think I find it easier to back than I do to lion because you, you, it's just more set up for the self fabric, for the main fabric, and then you sew it as you would normally. So I'll show you how it goes. So first things first, and second and third and fourth, the most important part of anything you sew, <laughs> obviously, is pressing. You have to press, you have to press before you cut, press after you cut, press while you cut, then you press before you pin something together, you can press it while it's pinned, and then you sew and you press every time after you sew. Anytime you pass across the fabric with the sewing machine, you should be pressing afterwards. The difference between something that looks homemade and something that looks store-bought is the pressing. If you don't press, your, your seams become lumpy. So I'm gonna start pressing all this fabric to get it ready to cut. One of the reasons I love kimono is the simplicity of the pattern pieces and you see that when you start to cut them. You see here I'm just folding the fabric into quarters and then what I do is I press it and cut along the lines of the quarters lengthways, so down the three meters of fabric and that's going to make up my pattern pieces that make up the entire garment like the way that a traditional Japanese kimono is made from a long roll of fabric you've done that by cutting your fabric into four long strips and then manipulating the garment from that. So it's great to just fold in half, press, cut that, fold again in half, press, cut that, and then you do it one more time to get the, the overlap and the colors out of the fabric. Really simple, there's no need for paper patterns, and I've made a video on this as well, um, as well as providing patterns on, on a website, so you can go and have a look at that and see how to do this with different fabric. This fabric is 143 centimeters wide, so you can cut four panels from it. And the other most regular fabric you'll find is 110 centimeters wide to 112. And from that you would cut three panels and do the same thing. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. One of the best things about making a kimono is this straight cutting and then straight sewing. So you can make something truly beautiful and also you have flat panels so you end up with with a canvas and i'll do a video on that as well because i often use metallic paints to paint um plain fabric with a kimono and it is it, it is so beautiful the results you get from that here now i'm just marking up the pattern so again i don't use paper pattern pieces because I don't need them they're all just measurements you your hem is five plus one or three plus one for a double turned hem and then you you come to this you use the center of each piece of um, pattern piece as well so you use the center of the of the body piece where it passes over the shoulder and from there you can measure where the where the um, sleeves are going to be sewn to down the pattern piece Again, this is all covered in the pattern that I've made and put on my website for the actual numbers. But it just shows that I'm not using a paper pattern, I'm just using a ruler and a piece of chalk. Um, and it, it's really fun and simple. Here I made the collar from the side with the selvage on it so that the against the neck is the soft plain fabric without the applique which would tickle and, and maybe irritate just a bit. I put this on and it is a very heavy, <laughs> very heavy kimono. Or, you know, I wear it as a banyan, like a, a circuit, just a, a coat over the top of stuff. In winter, it was fantastic. Um, very warm. So here I'm cutting the collars and the front overlaps from the last piece of fabric which I then folded once again to get the half width pieces and if you look at a traditional Japanese kimono this is what you do you cut this from the end of the of the roll into the half widths um, and when you're using traditional uh, Japanese fabric you don't actually have you again end up with a one one side of the seam that doesn't have a selvage on it so it's got a raw edge and in that case, what well, they do magnificent things, the Japanese with their with their raw edges to cover them and and 
and make them beautiful and they really do make them beautiful so you can see there I've cut the the collar and over collar the eri and the tomo eri and then I just center them and everything I this, this is where you attach the over collar to the under collar and so what you're doing is you're sewing you're placing on top of each other wrong side to right side so they're both facing upwards and then you have to sew it down to, eat. <laughs> to be honest sometimes I think it's easier to hand sew this but I do like to machine sew it just to you know make sure I still can and it's about marking where it's going to sit with its seam allowance so you press the seam allowance of the upper collar before you place it and then you chalk it and you you sew along that line there you see my machine struggle as it passes over those appliques it is very thick fabric when you get to the center you can see there's a little twist there in the little rosettes when you get to that there's like six or eight layers of this rather thick linen um, oh but god they're, they're so beautiful look at that in the in the sunlight so yeah so you can see I've marked where it will sit I hold down the seam allowance pin that and then sew along the middle of the seam allowance and that way when it's all attached there's a little bit of give in it as well it, it the the area sort of moves a little bit it's not like you see the stitching right along there there's a little fold over from the stitching about half a centimeter if you've done it right it should turn out like that and all your centers line up and I pin it together and then I just stay stitch so a, a five millimeter um, stitch just along the over collar part and that's to keep it in place when I'm then attaching it to the garment um, you can do this in in a um, basting thread or, or a contrast thread and then pull it out but you don't really need to it just keeps everything in place while you're sewing it so the stuff doesn't get warped as you pass over it when you sew it to the garment this was like a dream using this after the after the navy fabric it felt like i was using the lightest silk chiffon you've ever felt but it's actually it's 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 like a medium to lightweight linen so it, it, it's got some heft to it itself i'd love to make something just out of this and then paint it with metallic paints i think that would be absolutely beautiful silver on that chartreuse would be amazing here what i'm doing is i'm placing the pattern pieces together because I'm backing it you can see here I'm going to fold it over and then hand sew that down I'm just getting everything into place and I roll it up so I can keep it somewhere small and everything doesn't get wrinkled this is linen so it's going to crease quite easily so it's a matter of getting everything in its place and then rolling it up so it's easy to find and easy to use once I start backing the fabric now these panels are three meters long they're 40 centimeters wide but they're three meters long I, I don't know anyone who has a desk that's three meters long see everything has to be done in halves even my floor I can't get three meters in one way because I've got stuff all over the floor so there's a lot of using the half width which is why marking the half widths is really important because um, they, they can easily be lost if you just if you just use an iron to do it that you need to actually press it as a half width and then measure and measure twice when you do it and I roll them all up and there's all my fabric ready to be backed the backing process it takes a while what I do I you can see I've pinned it down on either side and I'll sew those seams down just with a stay stitch again and not too far in because I'm going to back it so I'll be turning over the edges so this is attaching the collar uh, you attach the collar down a diagonal it's quite easy to find actually because you come from the shoulder point and then just wherever the collar sits on the diagonal that's where it goes to it's usually about 78 uh, centimeters from the hem depending on your height so it changes and depending on the width of the fabric but it's around that around 70 to 80 centimeters up from the floor so you can see here I'm turning them out and I've I've machine stitched it down to the body and then I come in and you clip in 
to the sh to around the back neck so it doesn't pull as much because there's a lot of pulling going on there this is the only curved seam in the entire garment and it takes a lot of stress so you do have to clip in about twice on either side right into the stitch line there and then what I often do you have to f you fold in the you fold in the excess under into the collar and that gives the collar this oh, this beautiful weight to it without it it falls a bit flat um, you can obviously cut away this excess but when you sew it into it it makes it um, it makes it a lot more it makes it a lot more of a robust co collar and the collar holds itself onto the body because if the collar's light there's a lot of weight going on say down at the shoulders and down into the rest of the garment and the collar will keep itself on better and hold its shape if there's some more weight in it so if you do cut away the excess you could line the collar or back the collar uh, to strengthen it to get that same effect without having to deal with folding in the excess but that once you've done that once or twice, it's very easy to do. So the hand stitching has started. And <laughs> this, in one of those things that you think, oh my gosh, this is going to be the most beautiful thing I've ever done. And then halfway through, you just lose the will to live. Why did I ever decide to do that? Why didn't I just, why didn't I just make it out of something? Why didn't I buy an overlocker for... <laughs> <laughs> for Pete's sake but I didn't and I hand sewed this and to be honest it is one of the most beautiful things you'll see it at the end it is it's breathtaking the it did exactly what I thought and you can see up here you've got the straight bits between the appliques where the appliques meet and because they meet together you get this cloud effect and it looks like it's been it, it looks like it's been whittled out of wood or or something like that it's it's otherworldly and it's very regal um it really is i've i've called this the um the khan bayan so the bayan is the garment which is a a, a robe inspired by the kimono and the europeans went to japan and they saw the kimono they came back and using Chinese silks and Indian cottons and Japanese silks as well they they made something similar which is a loose fitting coat that's floor length like a kimono that men of letters would wear so if you had enough money to sit at home and and pen letters and write to your government and be part of the government wearing a skull cap this is the kind of thing that you would wear they would have a sash and they'd have pockets in it it would often have uh, western sleeves but sometimes they had the kimono sleeves on them. But it's it's inspired by the kimono, and, and I actually wear kimono the way that the the banyan um, was worn, which makes sense. I'm I'm from the west, and technically I'm a man of letters, although I'm a man of hand sewing needles at the moment. <laughs> oh, it's worth it. It is worth it in the end. You have to persevere. Drink lots of tea and get through it. <laughs> so much fun. Also hand sewing. There's, there is some... Um, I do like hand sewing because you can... You can change out your needle halfway through. You can go back on yourself. It, there, there's a lot of fun to be had when you're hand sewing a garment. And a lot of ease that you can't get when you're pressing something through a machine. There's a lot that can go wrong really fast when you're doing that, but if you see a problem with hand sewing, it can be, you can sort of see it from miles away and fix it before it's even happened. It's like it's sewing and it's sewing in slow motion, essentially, isn't it? So this is the the front overlap that I talked about, the half width piece, and this is the the center front. This is the the part that you see, and it's only got this tiny little little seam on it because it isn't doubled but I, f I found it so beautiful as well again it looks like it's been it's been whittled from from timber so it's some beautiful lacquered wood it's, it's incredible and once you get into a rhythm that's really fun it was just these bits these appliques were unruly because I've cut them you, you know they're, they're, they're sort of jumping out of the seams they're not held down properly here there or everywhere it was interesting to do fun though 
often if I'm using a machine to sew a kimono, I'll sew the whole thing by machine. It's it, it depends on the fabric. So this is extremely tough fabric to put through the machine. And if you look at the kimono, you can see there there there's probably there's probably around 10 layers in some parts there that you're going to have to sew through. My machine is a domestic machine. It, can't, it cannot do that. It wasn't made for doing that. So it's much easier just to whip through um, and hand sew this side down. The other side was all right because you're only going through three layers of fabric at that point. Um, but once you've turned under all the, um, all the excess bits that go under the collar, it's it was too much even with a with a strong needle that really would have struggled to get down there and do a good job of it that's that's the other part yeah i probably actually could have done it but it would have looked horrendous and there is something lovely about hand sewing down even if it's just one side of the the collar because it means that all your seams are hidden and it's just this smooth thing that sits at the top of the garment somehow balancing up there <laughs> with uh <laughs> with no reason you're like, how does this happen? It must be black magic. But no, it's hand sewing. One in the same, I'd say. But a great thing to do, great technique. Um, otherwise, if this, if this was regular fabric, if this was just what you can see here on the back of the collar, if it was just blue linen, I would have sewed down the inside, I would have sewn it to the inside first, turned it over, pressed it, done all that stuff, and then I would have either ditch stitched from the outside in um, catching the inside of the collar or I would have edge stitched so you see a seam on the outside of the kimono as well either way is fine and, and you know there's nothing wrong with being able to see stitching and being able to see a seam it's, it's the work that goes into the fabric the Japanese make an art out of being able to see it but you know Every every kimono is different, and and you you learn that as you start to make them. Every one, I I don't think I've made two. No, I have. I've made two that that were exactly the same. I made two for my nieces, and it was it was so easy just to do the same the same method for everything, rather than having to to sit there and think. Now, how's this part done? How's that part done? But usually, because I use a different fabric every time, and for some reason, I decide to back it like with this one, or line it with it was a really um, light silk or, or something, I usually end up learning a new technique with every single kimono I've made. And I've made about 30 by now, so so I've got some techniques under my up my sleeves. Not so sure. There again, you can see that thickness. It's, um, it really is thick. And I put a, a coat, uh, what do you call that? A coat hook? No, the coat loop. The loop that goes on the hook. Yeah. Anyway, I put that on the center back. I don't think I could ever use it on this one because it is extremely heavy. Um, and it doesn't matter if I went over that five times with the machine. I, I, I'd have to put steel into that loop for it to be able to hang onto a hook properly. And I'd have to get a pretty strong hook too. <laughs> Fantastic process there. And here she is. Oh, it is so beautiful. The Ching Khan by Yarn. Isn't it amazing? Does it, it looks like wood. That's what I think. Those chests that we saw at the start from Michael Wood's documentary looks exactly like that, I think. Oh, it's so beautiful. And then when you open it, it's this surprise. Who would have thought there'd be a chartreuse linen lining in there? And then these back seams. You see how they stand. They look like they look like they're holding up the roof of a of a palace. Little glimpses everywhere. And you see the just behind the the calf and at the the opening at the back of the sleeve. Oh, it makes me so happy to just see this. Fantastic, isn't it beautiful? This is one of my favourite color, color combinations in the world. To have chartreuse and navy together, they're they're born to be together. Absolutely fantastic, and you can see how it pulls at the bottom. So I made this for my height, but I think it actually would suit someone who's about 
who's sort of average female height really um, just so it can pull in that way oh it's so lovely and see how you've kicked out the hem there and then I also made the sash as well for it from the fabric I had to sort of patchwork the fabric together to get the sash because I wanted to make a really long one but it's fairly in so you can have that flash while you're wearing the sash or there's just these little hints of it running down the front if you can if you hold it flat oh isn't it a dream you can just imagine in Kublai Khan's court wearing this the middle of winter up there on the step snow billowing around you the breezes coming through that shoot through the skin like spears but you've got this huge bayon on and you look like the ruler fabulous <laughs>